All right, good. So let me start. Just minimize this. Um, uh, so first of all, welcome to the first uh, Tuesday seminar of the semester. This is a seminar where we have two hour lectures that are supposedly leisurely and uh, educational. And uh, I want to talk to, to give a talk about uh, expander graphs and how wonderful they are. And it's going to be introductory. I don't want to assume anything. Uh, and uh, the plan is that in the first maybe 20 minutes of the talk, I'll uh, slowly just define expanders and their properties and uh, um, maybe this will be boring to many of them, you, but uh, put us on some flat footing. Uh, and then most of the talk, I really want to focus on applications. Um, this is a, a talk I gave, uh, a version of a talk I gave like 10 years ago and I uh, just saw it on my website and uh, remember how much I loved giving it. So I, uh, I'm doing it again. Um, there's plenty of materials on uh, expanders. Uh, I want to recommend two things, two books online. Uh, one is this uh, monograph with Huri and Linal. Uh, it was published in the bulletin in uh, 2006. It's uh, very extensive and uh, there's a lot there. Only it was written 2006 and I should just point out that lots of things happened since then, but it contains a lot already. Um, and uh, another which uh, I now put on every talk that I have is this, uh, my book on complexity theory that just came out and it's also free online on my website. Uh, here you can read about expanders uh, in five pages as opposed to 150 on the left, but uh, uh, it's put there in the context of pseudo randomness, which actually takes a couple of chapters. So uh, this is an important perspective. Okay. So as I said, I'll focus on applications and it seems like, uh, you know, I think both in math and CS by now, if you don't have expanders in your pockets then uh, yeah, you are lacking something basic that may be useful to you. Uh, in computer science, uh, they're used all over the place, uh, whether you are designing algorithms or whether you are designing data structures uh, whether you are working in network theory, designing networks, in distributed computing, <coughs> whether you're proving circuit law bounds or proof complexity law bounds, if you are designing error correcting codes, uh, if you are working in pseudo randomness or uh, the randomization or information, um, you need them. At least there are many places where they are used. In math, uh, also, uh, they seem to appear both expanders per se and the notion of expansion uh, appear in many areas. This is just a partial list uh, of areas and of results. Uh, I'll mention some of them in geometry, uh, start with topology, geometry, connections to the Novikov and Baum Kohn's conjecture. Group theories are all over the place because group theory is used to construct expanders but they were used to resolve long-standing open problems like the diameter of uh, finite simple groups. Um, in measure theory, there are several places. Uh, there's this uh, Rusevich problem on the uniqueness of Lebesgue measure. Uh, there are these F spaces of Calton and Rogers where uh, you know, some you know, amazing inverse theorem about some modular functions where expanders appear out of the blue. In number theory, again, there are many, many applications that are using sieve methods. Uh, uh, I'll mention uh, application to distribution of integer points on uh, spheres, and there are many others. And of course, the expanders are graphs, so uh, they appear all over the place uh, in graph theory as examples, as counter examples in constructions, and so, so on. And we'll see some of that too. Uh, by the way, I didn't say, uh, please feel free to ask questions. Uh, okay, so I want to define expanders uh, and their basic properties. And I want to say that uh, the high level view, one big message to pick up is that 
These are sparse graphs that share many properties with random graphs that are similarly sparse. So it's a very powerful pseudo-random object. And uh, we'll see examples of this, uh, these properties. So here, they, here we come. So again, uh, these are graphs, finite graphs. Um, and you can explain the properties in many languages. Uh, in a combinatorial language, uh, you can say that the graph has no small cuts, or it's very, very highly connected. You cannot separate a set without severing many edges, as many as the size of the set. You can talk about it probabilistically. You can consider the random walk on the graph, <coughs> just moving from vertex to random neighbor. And uh, it converges extremely rapidly. So this probabilistic view can uh, describe it algebraically, think about the adjacency operator and its eigenvalue. So I'll elaborate on that, but uh, the main point here is that not only different languages describe these properties, but all these properties are identical. If you don't care about specific constants in the definitions, then all these properties are equivalent. And this is extremely useful. And it's not just useful. I think whenever you see something like this in mathematics, where an object can appear in many different areas, can be described equivalently in many different languages, it means it's fundamental and it should not be separated, but it uh, has lots of applications. So let me talk about each of them briefly again. It's all well known and uh, I'm sure many know it. I just uh, want to uh, say it and with some uh, common notation. So we have this graph, vertices V, edges E. Uh, we think of the degree uh, as a constant. Throughout the talk, I'll talk only about the regular graph, so every vertex has exactly D neighbors. <coughs> uh, and the number of vertices N will go to infinity. So the combinatorial or the geometric point of view, is, as I said, the graph is highly connected uh, uh, from geometric point of view, if you think of it like a discrete manifold, it has high isoparametry. Um, the surface area of a set is proportional to its volume. Right, so here I say it uh, with a picture. There are many edges crossing from S to the complement, roughly proportional to the size of S, as long as S is, let's say, not more than half the graph. How about the probabilistic uh, view? Then uh, you can, what's a random walk on the graph? You start from some vertex, and then you go to a random neighbor, and then you go to a random neighbor, and then you go to a random neighbor. So that's a random process. And uh, it will converge, if the graph is connected, it will converge to the uniform distribution because the graph is regular. Uh, in expanded graphs, it will converge in logarithmic time which is as far fast as you can uh, be up to constant because the diameter of such a graph is logarithmic. Okay. Um, and finally, the algebraic point of view. So here, as I said, you need to look at the adjacency matrix of the graph. And actually, really the matrix of the random walk on the graph, I put zero if there is no edge, and I put one over D if there is an edge. So it's a normalized adjacency matrix. Uh, it's a symmetric matrix. It has uh, real eigenvalues. And the important parameter for us will be lambda of G, which is a maximal uh, value of any non-trivial eigenvalue. So the trivial one is the eigenvalue one, lambda one. This is the eigenvalue of the uniform or the constant function. And all the others, I want to be smaller than one. Okay, so that's Lambda of G should be some alpha smaller than one. And one minus alpha uh, is called the spectral gap. If you view the Laplacian instead of the adjacency matrix, then uh, it will appear as a, as a spectral gap, but it's the same thing, basically. Uh, some people sometimes uh, distinguish between this parameter and lambda two, which is all, also important. Sort of the importance is basically distinguishing between bipartite and non-bipartite graphs. I'll stick with the, this definition of lambda g. So I want all eigenvalues with uh, have an absolute value 
uh, be smaller than one. Um, to define expansion, of course, you need an asymptotic definition. I mean, it was clear, but let me stress it. Uh, I'll call an ND graph, a graph with n vertices that's regular, And every connected graph, let's say non-bipartite, will have lambda of z less than one, but the gap from one can be going to zero. It can be one over zn squared. What we want is that it will be bounded away from one. So for this, uh, one formally defines a family of graphs to be an expander family. If it's a, a, you know, a sequence of growing graphs, in which all of them have degree D and all of them have the same bound delta on lambda of T. Okay, so far. Okay. Yep. Um, so let me show you a couple of the connections, the simple connections between these uh, parameters. And again, I'm sure you've seen them just to illustrate what they happen. I'll be very brief just to indicate that I even have some proof, but they are just, uh, just to show you that they take two lines. <clears throat> Why does the eigenvalue bound imply fast mixing? <clears throat> uh, maybe I should say even before that uh, the combinatorial expansion is essential to fast mixing because if there was a set uh, with a small uh, cut to the outside, the random walk could be trapped there for a long time. So <clears throat> that's a connection to the combinatorial expansion. The algebraic one, it's very simple. Uh, the limiting distribution is the uniform distribution u, let's call this vector u, one over n everywhere. And it's an eigenvector of this matrix with eigenvalue one. And let's see how any probability, other probability distribution, let's say starting at a particular vertex, but any <clears throat> probability vector will evolve under transitions uh, of this operator AG. Uh, well, it will just be multiplied by AG at every step, right? And so if you want to analyze how fast it uh, gets closer to the uniform distribution, let's say in L1, which is the best we can do the uh, statistical distance, uh, you can use cauchy schwarz and use the factor of N, but then you are in L2. And when you apply the definition of what P of T is, namely, that it's applying this operator and remembering that U is the fixed point of AG, then uh, you can take it out. So AG is acting T times on a vector P minus U, which is orthogonal to the uniform distribution, right? They are both distributions. So the sum of entries is zero. Uh, and we know all the eigenvalues are small. So you keep shrinking it by this factor lambda of T at every step. So that's very simple, it's a constant less than one. So you have uh, log n steps and the diameter in particular will be logarithmic in such steps. One more example, it's a very useful thing to remember and I'm sure many have seen it. It's a connection from the algebraic side to the combinatorial expansion. And in fact, it's a stronger statement, this alon chung lemma, which is now called expander mixing lemma. Uh, I said that there should be many edges from a set to the outside, but it's actually equivalent to the following thing, that for any two sets, they don't have to be disjoint. Uh, the number of edges between them, if they are large enough, will be roughly what you expect if it was a random deregular graph. So it's really this graph, this expander behaves like a random deregular graph. So formally, this is the expression. On the left-hand side, you have the number of edges. You subtract what you expect in a random graph. And on the right-hand side, uh, you have some number which obviously shrinks as long as lambda gets smaller. The proof of this, uh, again, I'll just flash it. Uh, you know, you just expand. This is a nice thing about algebraic, group, uh, algebraic uh, graph theory that you can uh, expand combinatorial properties in algebraic form. In this case, the number of edges between two sets is just a bilinear form 
uh, applying AG on the left to the um, indicator of vector of S, indicator of vector of T, and expanding. Here you, you have the facts you need, but I will not talk about them. And uh, the main term is what you have in a random graph, and the other terms you can bound with Cauchy Schwartz and uh, the bound you have on the eigenvalue. So it's very simple and very useful. So I want to draw some corollaries of this. Questions? Good. Yeah, I knew I could do this reasonably uh, fast. So I want to draw some corollaries, but just before that, I want to talk about, you know, if <laughs> without the existence of expanders, we'll be nowhere. Uh, and we have to talk about basic parameters and some corollaries of this property. Um, expanders were born uh, early 70s, late 60s. Pinsker was the first to, to define them. Uh, he proved this theorem. Most three regular graphs are expanders or d regular for any larger d. Of course, it's not true for two. Uh, the argument he used uh, appeared actually in an earlier paper of Kromogor and Baldwin, uh, who studied somehow the volume of the brain as a, as a network. Uh, anyway, it's a very, very simple probabilistic argument uh, that anybody will give in an exercise in undergraduate class. You just uh, take a random regular graph and just do, I want to say, just do a union bound over all sets and of all sizes. And you see that expansion happens. Okay, so that's a very easy thing to see. Uh, almost every deregular graph is an expander. Good. So what's the challenge? The challenge is to, to build one, to put your finger on one. Before I do, let me uh, want to mention specifically what explicit is. If I say, give me an explicit construction in mathematics, uh, it's typically explicit is uh, you show me uh, your construction and I'll tell you if it's explicit, like pornography in the Supreme Court of the United States. Um, in the eye of the beholder. But in the computer science, we have for formal way of defining this that are useful. And I want to distinguish two types of explicit constructions uh, or families of uh, expanded graphs. Weakly expanding means that you can just write down the adjacency matrix of the graph in polynomial time. And that's useful for almost all the applications, but not all. In some cases, and we'll see one or two, you need strongly explicit constructions. Uh, these are ones where you can describe exponentially large, large graphs. How can you do that? Well, uh, you want a polynomial time algorithm that if you tell me which graph, you know, the index of the graph you are in, and a vertex uh, in this graph, it will print out the constant number of neighbors, the d neighbors of this vertex. Right? So in this case, you can uh, talk about exponentially large graphs, the uh, description of a vertex is logarithmic in the size of the graph, and you want a polynomial time algorithm in that. This will become important. In fact, you can think, you can see in the random walk that I described, the random walk can be implemented uh, even on an exponentially large graph uh, if it's strongly explicit in polynomial time. All you need to know is the name of your vertex and you know which neighbors you have and draw one in front of Uh, you know, I'm not going to talk about ex uh, constructions, but I definitely want to show you one expander. In fact, an example that I'm sure you'll never forget if you didn't see it before. It's so simple, so amazing that it's expanding. Take a prime P, like 10 in this picture, but uh, many of you know that in computer science, you can always, uh, when you need it, take any integer to be a prime, any integer to be a power of two. Um, anyway, take a prime P, arrange its uh, elements mod P in a circle, connect them uh, to the nearest neighbors. And that's a degree two graph. And now I'm going to add uh, 
make it degree three, for every X, you connect it to its inverse modulo P. Okay, so you add this matching. Uh, what to do with zero, you can connect it to itself if you want. Okay, so this is a graph. I hope it's clear. I hope it's <laughs> agree that it's simple. And it's a theorem uh, of Lubotsky, Phillips, and Sarnak uh, in their famous paper on Ramanujan graph, but you will not find it there because uh, it appeared in an earlier version, somehow removed. It appears in other places like Lubotsky's book on expanders and other places, but uh, I want to point out, so that's a theorem, right? It's a, for every prime, it's a, you get an expanded graph, irregular, bounded away from, you know, second eigenvalue bounded away from one. Maybe it's 0.999, I'm not sure. Um, the thing is, nobody knows a sort of a direct uh, or elementary proof of this. Uh, it follows from stronger results uh, about expansion of SL to P. In the LPS case, they use Selberg's uh, 316 theorem. You can derive it also from Mugen and Gambot's proof on expansion of SL2P. But anyway, uh, I would love to see some <laughs> nice direct proof of the expansion of this graph. Anyway, so you've seen one whenever you need it. Uh, we saw this 0.9 or 0.999. In many applications, you would like lambda to be much smaller, close to zero. There's a very simple way to do it. <clears throat> you can amplify lambda of g in a very simple way. If I give you an N delta graph, um, and uh, you take its case power, case power I mean take the case power of the adjacency matrix, right? Uh, all the eigenvalues will also be raised to the k. So uh, you can shrink lambda of g as much as you like. The cost you are paying is increasing the degree, of course. It will also increase by power of k. So you can play with this trade-off. And uh, one very natural question is then, what's the, how small you can make delta as a function of g? Uh, and this uh, lower bound was given by Alon and Bopana in the 80s. Uh, lambda of g will always be at least this precise number, 2 square root g minus 1 over g, which is roughly 1 over square root g. Um, I gave below a proof of, you know, just a bound that's uh, roughly 1 over square root g, which is uh, just one line. You basically uh, compute the trace of the square of AG. It's, uh, yeah, as I said, and as you can see, it's one line. I won't go through this. I just want to mention that this bound is precisely tight. This is the famous uh, LPS paper. Uh, these are what you know, graphs meeting this bound are called Ramanujan graphs. Now we know other ways of uh, constructing them, the Markus Filman Srivastava. And uh, anyway, uh, that's exactly how good you can uh, make the second eigenvalue be in terms of the degree. Okay, what else I want to say about the uh, basic uh, um, properties? Uh, just uh, run through a few. Uh, one of them will serve us soon in some analysis. So if we have an ND delta graph, uh, here's another way and a really nice way to phrase the uh, uh, expander mixing lemma. Uh, if you have two sets uh, of vertices and you just pick a random edge in the graph, <clears throat> then the probability that one endpoint will land in S and the other will land in T is exactly what you expect in a random graph, namely the measure of S, the proportion of elements of S times mu of T, like as if they were independent up to this delta, which is the error bar. And you can derive from this, uh, you know, that uh, random neighbor of, uh, you, you can have S equals T and uh, random neighbor of S will land in S with the uh, probability it's measure up to delta. Um, the consequence of this is that uh, sets of size delta N must contain an edge. And because of that, you know, every independent set has size at most delta N. 
And because of that, the chromatic number of such a graph has to be at least one over delta. And this has the, you know, uh, remarkable consequence to a problem that uh, uh, was studied a lot in the graph theory literature. Uh, many of these expanders, like the expander I just showed you, have large girls. And so you can uh, have uh, graphs of simultaneously girth and chromatic number going to infinity. In fact, logarithmic, um, just by using expanders. So that's the best way to construct such graphs. Here's another corollary and uh, about the connectivity of the graph. You re remove a small fraction of the edges. Uh, most of the graph will stay connected. You of course can disconnect a few vertices sort of brute force, but that's all. And the one I'll use, the corollary I want to use has to do with what I call the infection process. So let me first tell you what the corollary is. <clears throat> they are all really directly follow. Um, every set S <clears throat> that's not too large in terms of delta, um, most of its elements will have most of its, their neighbors outside. Again, if the set is small, <clears throat> for almost all elements in S, most of their neighbors, the majority of their neighbors will be outside of S. And this is what we want to use. Uh, here's a very nice process on an expander. I think infection is in the news now. In fact, it's too much in the news. It's <laughs> ruining our life. Uh, let me describe, uh, you know, uh, somehow a septic uh, infection process on a graph. <coughs> Suppose that <coughs> an adversary can infect uh, some set of vertices that's not too large fraction is most delta over four of the vertices. So they are now sick. And now you define a sequence of sets in the graph and that's zero S one and so on. You can think of them as the sick vertices in time T. And how are they defined? Well, a vertex is sick in the step T minus T plus one if a majority of its neighbors if and only if a majority of its neighbors were sick in the previous process, okay? And it's immediately from corollary four that such an infection process will terminate in logarithmic steps, All right? It will basically, by, by the fact uh, above, uh, the sets will shrink at a geometric rate. So that's very simple. I want to talk about a slightly more complex uh, infection process in which the adversary can act at every step. Here the adversary is allowed to pick, is allowed to infect a set at every stage, set of at most delta over four vertices. So now <coughs> uh, <coughs> the sick uh, vertices are the S sub T, those that uh, were defined above by the infection process, union the ones that were just infected by the adversary. And of course here it will never shrink because the adversary keeps infecting uh, <coughs> elements, but it's very easy to see that this number will never grow above a delta over two. So it will forever remain bounded. And this is uh, what we'll use in the first application. Okay, so now I'm going to turn to applications uh, unless there are <coughs> questions. All right. Um, so there's no particular order to the applications, but I put just very old ones first. And one of the oldest, most beautiful ones uh, uh, happened here in the Institute. Uh, many of you know that uh, it's two fault tolerance computation. Uh, many of you know that in the late 40s, von Neumann was very busy building his uh, Joniac here in the place that it now occupies the, uh, the nursery crossroads. Um, and uh, the components of this machine were vacuum tubes. 
and vacuum tubes are the most unreliable component. And so Norman realized this, and being the mathematician he was, uh, immediately defined the model and asked uh, a very general question and solved it, as he used to do in so many areas of mathematics. So let me tell you what the uh, problem he defined. I mean, the basic problem is, you know, can you build, uh, you know, uh, reliable computers from unreliable components? That was his basic question. So think of a, a computation as a circuit, in this case, a Boolean circuit. I mean, a Boolean circuit just, you know, values arrive and you compute, you evaluate these Boolean gates. And that's the logic of most computers and uh, you compute some function. This is the case, this is in the case that all gates are reliable. They perform exactly the operation they should. Well, suppose, we are given such a circuit and we know that every gate <coughs> fails with some probability P. P, you know, is, is small, let's say it's most one tenth, but it's not zero. Clearly you cannot let the circuit alone because in a constant number of steps, you will lose all information. Let's say the, when a gate fails, it can output something random or something. You know, errors accumulate. And here was a, for nine months question, can you construct a, another circuit, possibly bigger, that will reliably compute this function? It's not clear at all that this is possible and certainly not clear if it's possible how large such a circuit would be. And I want to tell you his uh, solution. Um, let me just, uh, just beef up uh, the circuit so that I have room. I just added dummy, dummy nodes on the edges. Uh, what you're going to do is to take k copies of your circuit, k will be roughly logarithmic in S, and put them next to one another. Right now they are not connected. What you want is that every gate in the original circuit will now be simulated by a block of k, sort of identical, initially identical uh, gates. And this block will try together to maintain the correct value throughout the computation. So obviously to prevent things from accumulating, we need to reduce errors. They accumulate and you want to hit them. And then they accumulate again, you want to hit them. And for Neumann's idea was to put an expander uh, on every block. An expander, of course, he didn't have expanders, maybe didn't know about expanders. So he suggested random graphs. And later, as you see above, Dobrush and Orchikov and Pippinger, uh, you know, actually made his construction explicit with expanders. But here's the idea. Um, so again, uh, this majority gate just compute. So you have the constant uh, degree expander there and uh, uh, in every block. And they compute the majority of their inputs. And what's the idea of the analysis is basically really the infection process. You have some errors. You will go from the bottom and keep going up as long as we need. Nothing changes like in the infection process. We keep errors at bay or infection at bay. You have some uh, errors in some of these gates and uh, the majority by the corollary four we saw just shrinks this, this number. Um, but of course, then, you know, some of these gates, the majority gates themselves may be faulty. So this accumulates. And uh, in another block, similar things happen. You know, majority shrinks and something else accumulates. And then this continues to the next level. So all these arrows accumulate uh, from the left and from the right. And the uh, majority again shrinks them. And the adversary again, oops, the adversary again continues. Anyway, but uh, this infection process shows that the fraction of values in every block that is not the correct value of the computation is some small constant fraction. And so you can keep this forever. The cost of this is just logarithmic in the size. In fact, it's optimal. So 
that's how expanders are used there. Of course, uh, you all know the story uh, in, in the, you know, what unreliable components am I talking about? Uh, uh, in the 60s, they invented the transistor, silicon replaced the uh, vacuum tubes, uh, no errors appear in any computation, and, uh, you know, this thing was sort of forgotten. Uh, however, uh, they came back, I mean, this problem came back to haunt us. Uh, about 25 years ago, people started uh, trying to build quantum computers because of their theoretical power. And there, uh, all technologies, and also theoretically, um, it's very hard to avoid errors. And uh, people are trying to, and are building error correcting mechanisms, fault tolerant mechanisms for quantum computers. And ideas like this are being used, but much more. Okay, that was the first application. Okay, questions? There'll be many. Okay, I want to uh, talk about applications of uh, variants of expanders. These are expanders that are bipartite graphs, which are unbalanced. They don't have the same sizes. Uh, is this being recorded? Yeah, I think so. Yeah. Uh, okay, let me tell you about unbalanced bipartite graphs and there are many uses. Avi, you have a, a question in the chat. Um, yeah, please say, yeah, if you uh, see, please John, John asks, uh, is there a matching lower bound that says you can't do better than replicating the circuit k times? Yes, so uh, this log s, as I think I said, is a, is a lower bound too, yeah. Uh, you cannot beat a logarithmic factor if you want reliable computation, even for very simple circuits like linear circuits. It's a result of Pittenger, I believe, from the 70s. Uh, okay. Uh, so here's a normal expander. I want to first build a bipartite expander for me. That's very simple. That's what's called the double cover of the expander. You just uh, you replicate two copies of the vertices. For every original edge, you put you know, these two edges in the bipartite graph. But now you want, uh, let's say, the bottom side to be small, uh, smaller than n. Let's say it's n on either side. You want it smaller, we need it to be smaller, but still you want to maintain some expansion. <clears throat> I'll talk about one particular expansion with some parameters. Later we'll need stronger ones, but let's stick with this for the next application. So I want, <clears throat> in the original graph, I want that the uh, every set of size at most half the graph expands by a factor of three over two. Okay, that's easy to achieve with constant degrees. And to shrink uh, the number of vertices on one side, it's very easy. You know, I, I take two out of three in the another layer and just put this uh, K three two. Okay, now, I now just connect the top to the bottom, uh, simply along the path. So the graph I get at the end, maybe the degree went up by a factor of four, but now every set in the top layer is of size at most n over two, has at least as many neighbors in the bottom part as its size. Or in other words, every such set has a matching to the, other, to the bottom part. Okay, so it's a very simple construction. Uh, let me repeat it. Oh, uh, just encapsulate it here in the name concentrator, which is the way Basaligo and Pimsker in the 70s gave it. Again, what we get, what we can easily construct from expanders are these concentrators. You have n vertices on the top, two thirds n on the bottom, and every set of size n over two at the top has a perfect matching to the bottom. Okay, it's a, it's a non-trivial uh, notion. If you try to build something like this without knowing about expanders, I, I'm sure yeah, you'd be lost. Clearly a random one will work, but you'd be lost. So it's, yeah, lots of things here are magical. We just now take them for granted. 
Anyway, we want to use this type of concentrator in a second. Everybody is happy with this notion. It's a particular type of unbalanced bipartite expander. Here's at most n over two things. They see at least their size on the other side. Okay, as a perfect matching. Okay, so now we take a little detour. Um, these type of things are useful in network design. I want to tell you about a particular one. There are many, and I'll mention some. Um, many, 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 I should say. I mean, the impact of expanders on network design of all sorts has been enormous. So let's see a particular one, particularly beautiful one. This is the notion of super concentrator. So what's a super concentrator? It's a network that has n inputs i of size n, n outputs o of size n, and some other vertices and edges as you like. Okay, and what it should satisfy is the following uh, very strong connectivity property. You want that no matter how you take k, a number between one and n, you take k inputs and k outputs, you want that there'll exist k vertex disjoint parts between the two, okay? So here are k and here are k, and here are k vertex disjoint parts between them. Okay, this should hold for every k and every subset. Uh, okay, you want to construct something like that? Well, okay, certainly you can, right? I mean, you can simply put a complete bipartite graph between the inputs and the outputs and you have it, right? But this has quadratically many edges. What's the minimal number of edges you need? This was a question Valiant asked himself. And I must tell you the reason he asked it because it's so bizarre. I mean, this construction that's so useful came out of a completely different field. He asked it because he realized that the answer, how small such a network must be, will give a lower bound to any circuit computing the discrete Fourier transform. What's the connection? It's a beautiful connection, I'll show you in a slide. But that's really the source of his, uh, his motivation. Uh, in fact, it's more general. The number of minimal number of edges is a lower bound on uh, the computation of any linear transformation A, so given X compute AX, uh, because any such, yeah, if, if all minors of A are non-singular, like for example, the Fourier transform matrix over prime field. So uh, why is this true? I mean, it's very simple. Uh, so I claim every such circuit is a, constant, is a super concentrator. And it's uh, very simple. Uh, we need k, k vertex with joint paths from any subset to any subset of size k. Uh, and we claim that any circuit for this computing this linear transformation must have it. If it didn't for particular subsets of some size k, then there'll be by Menger's theorem, there'll be a k minus one cut, k minus one vertices you can separate that will separate the k vertices on the top and the bottom. But that would mean that, uh, you know, if you zero out all the uh, excess outside this set, uh, that you will be uh, computing this non-singular transformation. Uh, you can write it down as you know, this k by k matrix uh, as a product of k by k minus one times k minus one by k. So it's all linear here. So, uh, contradicts non singularity, and therefore every circuit for any such uh, computation must be a super concentrator. So it's a brilliant idea rather than proving a lower bound on circuit complexity for a particular function to realize that there is a graph theoretic property underlying it and prove just a lower bound for any graph with this property. And this property looks very strong. Having a you know, subquadratic number is uh, not obvious. 
So that was its plan to prove a superlinear low bound, but uh, instead it discovered that one can do it in linear style. And that's the thing that was, became the value of uh, network theory. And uh, until today, we don't know a superlinear low bound on any, uh, any problem, any linear transformation in particular. Okay, so now I want to tell you how to construct such things from expanders, actually from this concentrator. Uh, this is a simpler proof due to Pippinger. It's so beautiful. So clear what I want to do, right? I want to describe to you a super concentrator with a linear number of edges. Okay, so what's uh, Pippinger's idea? So the, well, <clears throat> we want to handle every value of K Let's just uh, look at the simple case where this k uh, is less than n over two. If it's less than n over two, then we can use recursion. Remember we had this concentrator. Uh, and if we had some k points on top and the k points on bottom, we can match them one to one to the smaller set and then we can just build a smaller super concentrator. That will be, well, anyway, it's a reduction, which will, because the concentrators of, of linear size will, you know, give a linear size uh, recursion. Uh, this is really beautiful, but seems, uh, you know, useless because what do you do with large sets? And here's a second brilliant idea. Just add, here's a set. And it's just pigeonhole argument. Besides this, just add a matching from the top to the bottom, just n edges. What's the value of this? Well, if you have more than n over two uh, inputs and outputs you want to connect, there'll be an intersection between the sets. So you can match them using this uh, matching and be left with at most n over two. And then you use the recursive construction. So here's a simple recurrence. Don't have to read it. Clearly uh, results in a linear number of edges. So this is it. That's just one um, application of expanders to network theory. Uh, like I said, there are many. Uh, there are such applications to permutation networks, non-blocking networks, routable networks, and you know, there's a zillion of things. And in distributed computing in particular, where you um, have networks of computers where anyone can talk only to their neighbors, uh, this is also ex extremely useful to investigate how locally you can do things. Uh, I want to mention one particular result uh, very different than the previous one. Uh, I mean, not very different because it talks about routing. Um, uh, it's a sequence of works. I am just taking just the strongest uh, result that we know because it's online. Uh, it's an online result. So assume you have a G, a sufficiently strong expander. What you would like to do is connect pairs S1, T1, S2, T2, up to SK, TK, uh, to each other by edge disjoint path. Okay, uh, let's think about this for a second. First of all, I note that it's different than the previous question because now you want specifically to connect S1 to T1. Before and we just asked to connect the top set to the bottom set. Now we specify which one is connected to which other, which is of course harder. How many pairs can we even expect to have? Well, distances in an expanded graph we said are typically logarithmic. So we cannot have more than n over log n like that. And uh, this can be matched. So there were existence theorems and efficient algorithms to find uh, such paths. And in this result, these paths are actually uh, found even if the pairs are provided one at a time. And you never need to erase a path you create. So in the old telephone networks, you can always connect 
uh, people to whoever they want to call without disrupting other callers. Of course, it's very it's irrelevant. Anyway, so these are the this is the nature of uh, applications of this type. And uh, okay, we come to a completely different story. So let me ask again all the questions. And if you send the chat, I won't see it, but uh, somebody will tell me, like Cynthia. Okay. Uh, ready for the next one. The one of the most beautiful again. Um, Error correcting codes. So, what are error correcting codes? Good for, uh, you know, I'm talking to you. Sorry, Avi, uh, I'm too slow. There is a question in the chat. Yeah. Uh, from from John Peebles again. Um, okay. I mean, John, if you, you're very yeah. welcome to read this out. <laughs> Okay, uh, is, there, is there an LB for a reliable circuit construction that applies even if one is given or allowed to produce the input output encoded via a helpfully chosen error correcting code, uh, where to prevent making the problem trivial, we require the code be chosen before knowing the circuit? So, uh, I mean, this uh, general comment, I value every question, but some such detailed question maybe will delay till after the talk and I'll maybe digest it and, uh, yeah. uh, okay. So uh, let me uh, continue with error correcting codes. So what are codes good for? Um, yeah, for communication and storage and uh, stuff. I mean, basically you want to handle again, errors, noise and so on. I'm talking to you, maybe some uh, noise in the microphones, uh, maybe my accent is blurring things and stuff. <clears throat> uh, the question is what to do if uh, uh, what you receive is uh, somehow erroneous. By the way, it's clear that our brains do it. I mean, if you understand me, it means that some, <laughs> there must be some <laughs> error correction happens in your brain. Uh, and it also means that speech is redundant. Uh, anyway, so the idea is to formalize this and you want to introduce redundancy into sending messages. Uh, you want to be able to uh, take a message you want to send, add some redundancy to it so that if later errors occur uh, in the message with, in the code word which is being sent, uh, the receiver can decode it and know what was actually sent. So let me formalize it. Let me give you just a one slide, uh, you know, primer on coding theory, on very basic coding theory. Started with the Shannon, Shannon Humming in the late 40s. Um, so we'll think just of binary codes, although one can think of other alphabets. A code is a mapping from K bits to N bits. So n is bigger than k, that's the redundancy we add. And I'll abuse notation, the code is also its image. So it's a set of things produced by the mapping. There are two ma <coughs> major parameters. Of course, one is a rate capturing the redundancy. It's k over n, it's a number at most one. We want it to be as large as possible so that we don't waste uh, bits. And the distance. The distance uh, is the minimum distance between any pair of code words of different messages. Okay, distance, I mean humming distance, how much they differ. Obviously, if they, every pair differs by a lot, then if the number of errors is less than half of that, at least information theoretically, you know where your message came from or what was the original message sent. Okay, so rate and distance, and we like this to be as large as possible in constant fractions so that we can tolerate maybe constant error rate. So obviously there is a conflict between the two, right? And uh, you cannot uh, have no redundancy and have high distance. If k equals n, uh, then distance would be one and not linear. So we define 
a code to be good or asymptotically good if both the rate is constant and the distance is constant time frame. Okay, so that's a one gold standard. And Shannon, uh, in his famous paper where he created communication theory, information theory, coding theory, uh, proved that random codes exist. He proved much more, but uh, uh, he proved that uh, random codes are good with high probability. Again, one of the very early applications of the probabilistic method, more or less the same time that Erdős did his Ramsey argument, and of course, completely independent. So they exist, that's good. In fact, it's an exercise again for undergrads to prove that even a random linear code is good. You just pick C to be a linear mapping on F2, and N is, I don't know, 2K or 10K, whatever distance you want. Um, and you see that uh, you can get, you know, with high probability, just a churn of bound and union bound will give you uh, that most codes, most linear maps are good linear codes in this sense. So obviously the problem, like with expanders, uh, was and much more important at the time because uh, this was obviously going to be used in uh, communication and in storage was to find uh, good codes that are explicit that one can describe not random and that can be efficiently encodable and decodable so decodable i mean from error from noise it took a long time <laughs> about 20 or 25 years to actually resolve this uh, so it's a highly non-trivial problem and uh, these uh, solutions were algebraic. And in fact, lots of coding theory is algebraic. Many codes are based on polynomials, some on algebraic geometry, etc. cetera. Uh, but at the same time, in fact, earlier, another solution existed. A beautiful idea of Gallagher, in fact, his PhD thesis, at MIT, uh, showing how to construct good codes, good linear codes from graphs. Uh, this was sort of forgotten, both because, of course, he didn't have expanders, he was talking about random graphs, and so it was not really explicit, and his analysis was off. Uh, but it picked up, uh, first by Tanner in the 80s, and uh, who realized already that expanders are useful for that and then uh, much more powerfully by Sipster and Spillman. Uh, and this is what I really want to show you. I just want to point out that one thing that comes, so these are combinatorial codes, if you want, graph-based codes. Uh, one thing that comes of the theory, I mean, the two, you know, the, the combinatorial side and the algebraic side in coding theory by now coexist, compete, interact. Um, and uh, there are, of course, many more parameters I didn't describe that one can study. Uh, one thing I want to note is that uh, the one thing that can be done, at least today, up to today, only using graph-based methods, is this beautiful result of Spielman uh, that doesn't just give uh, all, all that we want, but in fact gives it with linear time encoding and decoding. So no other code, no other good code is known for this property. And what I love about this result is that it's really inspired by the super concentrator construction that I've shown you. So the ability to have linear time encoding arises from a very similar construction to this similar to this super concentrator one which came of circuit complexity. Okay, so let me explain to you how to build codes from graphs. Um, that's Gallagher's idea. So here are the parameters again. So we take such a uh, unbalanced bipartite graph G of constant degree. We have N nodes in the bottom and the N minus K in the top. We remember K is what we want the message size to be. And I want to tell you how this combinatorial creature defines a linear code. 
So how do we know if, if a sequence of length n is a code word? So take a sequence of length n, let's say z, and think of this network as a circuit, as a linear circuit. So let's put gates in the top and evaluate them. Okay, so every gate at the top, every you know, node at the top computes the parity of its neighbor in G. So G can be thought of as a linear mapping. If it happens that all the outputs are zero, then you declare Z a code word. Okay, Z is in the code if G times Z is in zero, namely if Z is in the kernel of this mapping. So first of all, you see that any such graph gives you a linear function, right? Um, we define the kernel, but we can define the generator matrix easily. And these are sometimes called LDPC codes because the parity check matrix um, has constant degree, um, this kernel uh, verifying matrix. Two properties are immediate. The rate is at least k over n, right? I mean, this maybe these linear equations are redundant, but it's at least k over n. So we get rate k over n. And because the linear mapping the encoding is efficient, it's just uh, evaluating the linear functions at most of our time. So what's really difficult, or it's not really difficult if you have this amazing idea, um, is the that if the graph is a strong enough expander, random graphs are strong enough expanders, uh, then both the distance is linear, but moreover, even, even the um, deco decoding is possible in linear time from a linear fraction of error. Okay, so the next slide will prove it. It's just one slide proof. Uh, this explicitly appears in Sipser and Spielman. Um, let me explain what lossless uh, expanders are. So it's an unbalanced bipartite graph. What you want is that a small linear fraction of the uh, bottom part, just a, a small set at the bottom, expands a lot to the top. And a lot I mean now not just by a constant fraction, I mean by a factor very close to D. Think that you have much less than N over D vertices in the bottom, N over a million D. And this was a random graph. Clearly, most of their neighbors on the top will be disjoint, even if K is N over T, right? And that's lossless. So every set expands by a factor close to D. And I'll define it. And I'll actually give an example. Uh, Sipsar Spielman didn't have lossless expanders. Uh, uh, so I'll tell you uh, that uh, we constructed them. Uh, Kapal, Boran, Gozvadan, and myself in uh, 2002. Sipsar Spielman had a way around it. Uh, maybe I'll say something about it. But uh, anyway, they exist, so let's use them with just particular parameters. <coughs> uh, you can get uh, <clears throat> variety with this type of <clears throat> relation. So let's take k to be n over two, um, constant degree, let's say 10 at the bottom. And like we said, sets, small sets in the bottom expand by almost a factor of the degree. So sets of size, let's say small n over 200, expand by a factor of nine. So almost 10. The important thing about this, and I'll repeat it, is that the neighborhoods of these vertices in B are almost disjoint. Okay, so suppose we have such a graph. Here it is. And suppose we are given some corrupted code word, right? We are given a sequence, and then some adversary fiddled with some small set at most n over 200 uh, of the bits. We of course don't know which bits these are. We don't know B. You can see them, but uh, the decoder cannot. And uh, we somehow want to find them and uh, fix them. What do we do? Well, I mean, the, the, 
one obvious thing we can do, we can still evaluate this linear map, right? And we find that, uh, you know, now it's not all zero, there's some ones there. And now we can start to uh, use this information in order to reduce the number of errors. And it's really simple. What you do is the following. Um, I guess it's uh, G times W. Uh, as long as this GW is not zero, you will just flip those values of W that have a majority of their neighbors telling them to flip. And the majority of their neighbors are ones where they should be zero. If you think about them, uh, this it sh you know should work. I mean, most vertices in B get their messages from vertices on the top that are completely disjoint from all the others. There's some small overlap, but you can easily see that uh, if B was the initial set of corrupted position, and here's the final set, well, it will shrink by a factor of two. And because of two simple sub facts, one is that uh, very few elements in B will have a majority uh, of ones just because of this disjoint neighborhood on average. And on the other hand, you can corrupt things that were uncorrupt, but again, the same, it all goes back to this corollary four about small sets, very few will be newly corrupted. All in all, uh, after one round, you will have half of the number of corruptions, repeat it a uh, logarithmic number of times. And in fact, the whole thing is linear, uh, will give you a, a code word, a legal code word. Okay. Questions about this? So I should say that uh, Sipsa Spielman did not have uh, lossless responders, even though they considered it like if the graph was random. Uh, it turns out that you can do more clever things. Actually, already Tanner did it in his construction in 81. You don't have to put one linear equation in every vertex. You can put a few. A few that define some kind of code with a little distance. So you have lots of local codes, not the parity code, but some uh, other local codes. And then you don't need this uh, lossless condition, normal expansion would be. Okay. So this is a story with the coding. And now I'm wondering if to take a break or uh, to continue. Uh, let me take a break. Let's uh, take it. Uh, so first of all, well, okay, we'll take a, we'll repeat, renew at 11.50. Now it's 11.41, uh, 11.50. And uh, I'll continue with the rest of the applications and some about constructions. Um, but before that, any questions? Uh, Avi, I have yeah. a small question. Yes. Uh, about these lossless expanders that you constructed. So first of all, uh, I mean, is the construction have any algebraic flavor? Is no, it no, it's a zigzag product type construction. Uh, it doesn't have, and I don't know any algebraic uh, construction that will come close. Let me stress, and I will talk about it at the end. Again, I want to ask a few open questions. Eigenvalues are useless. Okay, not eigenvalues. Yeah, that, Maybe, that's my uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Eigenvalues are useless. And I mean, second eigenvalue, all the eigenvalues. You really need, maybe, of course, if you do all the eigenvectors, then you know everything. <laughs> so, in principle, the algebraic construction, algebraic uh, information uh, is equivalent, but no arguments. Uh, uh, in fact, it is known, it's a result of uh, Kahale, that there are Manujan graphs. Uh, where expansion uh, is not more than the degree over two. Okay. So you cannot get to, you know, yeah. 0.99 of the degree or 0.9 of the degree. In fact, you cannot beat a half. Just a second eigenvalue is not enough. And, and what about the, so you, you mentioned in the beginning, mm -hmm. you have the equivalence between 
combinatorial expansion and probabilistic expansion and uh, spectral algebraic expansion. What about between the probabilistic expansion? Can you have like a, I, I just I guess like a cutoff could imply a lot yes. of expansion? You know, there are more refined parameters and I didn't get into them. If you just uh, allow me constants everywhere, so you want a constant gap in the, the constant spectral gap, you, will, you want convergence in L1 up in constant logarithm times log, if you want, that every set expands by a constant, the number of edges by a constant, then all these things are equivalent. Once you start looking at uh, more refined parameters, uh, then uh, there's, uh, you know, maybe no equivalent. In particular, we don't know equivalent uh, algebraic condition, probabilistic condition to lossless expansion. And I should stress also here that <clears throat> these lossless expanders that we build are in this bipartite sense, they expand losslessly from top to bottom. But we don't know how to construct just lossless expanders. It's enough for most applications, but still it's, uh, anyway, I'll talk about it at the end. Uh, okay, so I want to tell you about a few more applications, uh, <clears throat> very different ones. <clears throat> um, I, I hope it's clear that, uh, you know, some of these applications uh, solve major problems in the areas where they were applied to, that uh, some of them stood open for many years, and uh, I want to tell you a few more of this. Um, so back to networks, I, this is a major result, but uh, I will not spend time on details. I want just to tell you about it. Uh, it's to sorting networks. So now we are back, forget the bipartite graph, we are back to uh, normal uh, graph, the regular. Here's the problem <coughs> of sorting networks. Everybody knows that uh, you can sort n numbers in n log n comparison. There are many ways to do it. Sorting networks are uh, different than sorting algorithms in that they are non-adaptive. In an algorithm, you can compare two numbers and you know, if they are bigger, compare one pair. If they are smaller, compare another, one is smaller than the other, compare a different pair. So they are adaptive, all of them are. And sorting networks want them to be non-adaptive. You think of the inputs arriving on the left and various pairs are compared. In this picture, there are these vertical lines. So let's say the smaller one goes to the top, the bottom one, the larger one goes to the bottom. And at the end comes the sorted, sorted sequence. Um, as I said, many sorting algorithms take an log n time and uh, people tried very hard to construct similar sorting networks and the non-adaptive algorithms. But the best they could do with various networks were n log squared n time. And that was an open problem for a long time until Isaac Komlosh and Semarelli heard about it. And uh, what they proved is that uh, uh, there is a network which sorts in n log n comparators. In fact, it just has log n phases of sort of n parallel comparison fields. And I want to tell you what the network is of the analysis. The network is really simple. You just compare all the periods. So edges in an expander are pairs. Just compare these pairs of elements. This is your network. And now we do it again and do it again, log n time. What will come out at the end is a sorting sequence, sorted sequence. It's as simple as that. This constant, uh, maybe million, maybe, I don't know not 10 to the million, but uh, it's large. The proof uh, is one of the uh, most amazing to the force, combinatorial to the force I, <coughs> I know. Uh, even after some people try to simplify it, it's, it's still really, really complicated and reveals lots of extra properties of expanders. I mean, you really have to try to imagine why the information of comparing pairs uh, of elements that are on a sequence of expanders are good. Uh, you can 
draw some consequences from them that will allow their continuation to uh, have these properties. So as I said, this uh, uh, extremely complicated. I just want to mention a corollary of this. If the input sequence is a binary sequence, so just zeros and ones, uh, it will come out sorted, right? So it will be zeros first and then ones. And if you think what the comparator is uh, for such Boolean values, uh, you know, the uh, minimum is an and and the maximum is an or. So this is a Boolean circuit. Now, if you just look at the middle output, this will allow you to know if the you know, the majority value is more ones and zeros, more than zeros and ones. Having a polynomial size formula for majority, a monotone one, like this one, uh, was an open problem a long time. It was uh, solved by Valiant, but uh, non-explicitly using a beautiful probabilistic arg argument. And this uh, sorting network in its parallel version, Logan uh, round, uh, immediately gives such a formula. So it's the only explicit polynomial size formula known for computing the majority function, which is a very much simpler problem than sorting. Avey, can I ask a question? Yes. Uh, so you said, you know, earlier that the, you really wanted to see a simple proof of the LPS graph expansion. So I would love to understand the proof of the sorting network. And I was wondering, do you think that it could, do you also look for a simple proof or wish for one, or do you think somehow it can't be simplified? I don't think, well, it can, it was, can and was simplified. I think it has oh, to okay. remain complex. Uh, uh, yes, it's, uh, it has uh, really non-trivial ingredients because you need really good notions of progress and proving that the expanders uh, have these, you know, capture these uh, notions of progress. Uh, yeah, I mean, it just, I think it's a really complex problem, and I can't, I don't hope for a really simple proof. That's interesting, because I don't understand still the proof I gave yes. up. At, at I, Patterson, I, Mike I, Patterson has uh, maybe the simplest proof I know. You can find it. Okay. Okay, now here I come to a very different application, very fundamental application. I'm not going to talk much about pseudo-randomness, but I'll just show you this one. Uh, and it's the uh, first, maybe the only here application where I really need strongly explicit construction of expanders. And you'll see where it comes in. And this is a very basic result that's very useful. And I think mathematicians should know it independently of <laughs> anything. Okay, so what's the setup? Uh, we are going to do what's called a deterministic error reduction. You don't have to be interested in this per se. You'll just see what comes out. But uh, anyway, here's the problem. Uh, imagine that you have a probabilistic algorithm for assumption, uh, for primality testing. You want to know if X is a prime. Uh, what is a probabilistic algorithm? It's basically a deterministic algorithm, which takes the input X and also takes a binary string, let's say of length N, which we will call R, and uses it in the computation in such a way, it's a good algorithm. If with high probability, we get the correct result, high probability over R for every X. Okay, that's a probabilistic algorithm. So suppose you, uh, yeah, so this just depicts, uh, you know, possible random strings, all the possible binary strings of length N that uh, one is chosen randomly to this algorithm. Suppose you go to the store and buy such an algorithm, maybe for primality test, and uh, it guarantees that the error is at most one third. Okay, so you know that the uh, probability that uh, you know, you'll get the wrong answer on X is at most one third. Let's say the answer is yes or no, like in primality testing. But you are not satisfied. Maybe you want the error to be, uh, you know, one in a million. Maybe you want the error to be two to the minus N. What do you do? Well, uh, first let's see what does it mean that the probability of error is one third, that for every X, there is some bad set here of at most measure one third that will lead to the wrong answer, but all the others will give the correct one. 
If you want to reduce the error with a standard way that everybody knows, you just repeat it many times, right? You take k time. You pick, instead of uh, one random string, you pick k random strings independently. You feed each to the algorithm, you run them all, and then you take the majority value. Well, you take the majority value because you know you expect one third error, the probability that you'll get more than half error decays exponentially in k. And so you amplify the, the error. Uh, this captures the, you know, in the Chernoff bound, basically, right? If uh, they are all independent, and I express here that random bits are a resource. So if you do it k times, you really need k n random bits. Then you get uh, that the probability that uh, you'll have an error, namely that this random set of strings, k strings, more than half of them fall into bx, uh, is exponentially decaying in k. So you can use it to reduce the error. If you want to, to the minus n, you'll have to pay n squared b. And the question in uh, uh, lots of derandomization uh, task is the most basic one is can you remove randomness? But here this is a black box problem. You cannot. I mean, you are given the algorithm. You can use it as a black box. But do you really need to pay k n bits if you want to reduce it to such exponentially small uh, value? Can you maybe have the strings be dependent on an, one on another somehow? Don't use so much randomness. And everybody who knows the proof of the Chernoff bound and knows how crucial independence is there, uh, you know, would probably think not. So here's uh, again the wonder of expanders. Uh, we'll just throw expanders to the mix. So how will we do that? We just impose on our abstract set of strings an expander graph, expander graph of size two to the n, exponential size of constant degree g and some spectral bound, one h. And I want this G to be strongly explicit. I want to know the neighbors efficiently. And now assume that we don't pick the, these K strings randomly, but we pick them from a random walk. We pick a random vertex, and then we pick a random neighbor, and then a random neighbor until we have K of them. And these are what we want, what we feed to our algorithm. And it turns out another wonderful result of I type commerce and Sam Reddy. Uh, they proved uh, it in a different context, but this follows directly from their work, is that the result doesn't change. The error will decay exponentially in K, even though there's huge dependence of this random string. Think about it. I mean, you invest n bits in the first uh, R1, but then only another constant, a random neighbor, and then another random neighbor. So they're extremely highly dependent on each other. Very highly dependent. And nevertheless, you get the same consequence. So you need to pay, even if you want the error to be exponential in N, you still need just a linear number of random bits. Uh, this, uh, has the application I just stated, but there are many uh, very different applications. Uh, I gave a talk on this uh, when I arrived here at the Institute, a couple of years after I arrived, and uh, actually Venkatesh was a postdoc here, and uh, he heard this, and the following week he had an improvement to the Duke problem on distributing uh, uniformly points on integer points on spheres. Um, uh, it has many extensions too. Many of you would know that, you know, you don't have to have Boolean values. I mean, there's the Hofting bound that uh, has the same proof. Basically, if you just have some uh, function on the vertices of this graph on, on zero, one to the end, uh, let's say with range between zero and one, some bounded function, and you want to compute its mean, then you can approach the mean uh, if you put pick independent samples, if you take k samples and average them, uh, you know the distance uh, um, to the mean will uh, uh, will be better and better with the exponential exponentially small probability uh, in k. And uh, it turns out this is a proof of uh, result of Galvin 
even this very fine uh, result holds when you have expanded. There are other extensions. Uh, you don't have to average real numbers. There are matrix churn of bounds and matrix of big bounds, but the, your function is not a real function, but a matrix valued function. There are such results for independent uh, sampling, and it extends. This uh, you know, it's a much more complex result. Uh, Garg, Sivastava, Lee, maybe someone else. Uh, anyway, expander, just a random walk of an expander looks like an independent set of random points uh, to lots of purposes. It's a very strong method. That's how pseudo random it is. Questions about this? Okay, I want to switch to something mathematical for a few minutes, a mathematical application. Uh, metric embedding, so completely different topic. I'll talk only about embeddings to L, or almost always embeddings to L. Uh, two, so switch context. We are in uh, Banner space theory, if you want. We have a metric space uh, uh, X, excuse me, because I'll use D for distance and not for degree now. Uh, a finite metric space X, um, some distance measure D, and it embeds to L2, L2 I mean Hilbert space, the finite or infinite dimensional, doesn't matter. Uh, it embeds well, which means with distortion delta, if uh, there's a function, there's an embedding that doesn't distort the, uh, distances very much. So the distance in the, after the embedding in L2 is, at least the original distance in the metric space is not delta times the original distance. Okay, so now you have an arbitrary metric space. You can ask how well can, can you embed it to L2? And it was uh, some long standing problem that Bourguin solved in absolutely gorgeous way, a beautiful probabilistic argument. He proved that any endpoint metric space, doesn't matter the metric, uh, embeds with distortion at most log n into L2. Okay, so I'm not going to go into this. I want to talk about the tightness. How tight is this result? Do you have to pay log n? And he worked pretty hard on this and he came up with a nearly tight, like log n over log log n construction from metric. But actually, uh, of course, the right metric with proving a tight bound comes from an expander. And this was noticed by Lina, London, and Rabinovich. So here is the proof, one line. Uh, take the distance, measure. so you have a, your space is going to be just the vertices of a graph the with a constant degree, C, let's say. Uh, and uh, the dis yeah, you use a distance matrix, uh, the shortest path distance. Why is it hard to, dis to embed something like this in a, into L2. It's really simple. Here's another way to formulate the uh, spectral bound. If you take the adjacency operator and subtract from it the uh, sort of, or the random walk operator, you subtract from it the random walk operator of the complete graph, C over N, uh, think of this as your binary form. If you apply it, if you think of it as a quadratic form, apply it on any function, this will be bounded by our parameter lambda of g uh, times the norm of the function. Basically, the subtract, subtraction takes off the uh, constant functions and you basically are left with the orthogonal complement. So it's very simple and it has an interpretation, a combinatorial interpretation that's very useful, often called the Poincare inequality. You compare uh, two expectations. Uh, on the right, you have the distance between the value of the function at x and y averaged only over edges of your graph. And on the left hand side, you have the same thing, but averaged over all pairs of the graph. And the two are related in an expander by a constant factor, the spectral gap, one minus lambda. This again, equivalent to the spectral definition. Uh, why is it useful? Well, 
look at the definition of distortion, look at the right hand side. We know that neighbors in the expander of distance one, and we have distortion delta. So, yeah, so this was all pairs and these are the neighbors. Uh, this is at most delta squares, right? Distortion is delta and we are squaring it. What about the left hand side? We average over all pairs. Most pairs in a constant degree graph have distance logarithmic. So this will be at least some constant times log n squared. Boom, you get delta at least some constant log n. This is it. This work was extended in many different ways. I want to tell you about a few and expanders play a role there too. Um, I'm going to talk about the uh, nonlinear spectral gaps and embeddings to other convex spaces, not just L2. Uh, so he stated the Poincare inequality, which implies, so you see that the Poincare inequality implies uh, distortion lower bounds. And here again, I stated it for the case of uh, L2. Here the constant in the inequality is just a one of other spectral gap in the way I phrase it. And People ask, what about other sort of other norms? Let's say LP norms. And Matushek proved this beautiful theorem that uh, any expander, even though expanders are sort of captured by the L2 property, by the second eigenvalue, they work in the same way, give a uh, Poincare inequality for any LP norm. And then uh, people will get greedier as in mathematics. And ask what about other convex, uh, you know, other norms? And the most maybe thing you can hope for is this, uh, uh, you know, norms which are uniformly convex, namely norms whose ball is, uh, you know, sort of round. I won't define it formally. You, you can't allow sort of corners. Um, so. Here's a, here are two results, in fact. Uh, now it's, we don't know it for every expander, but uh, let's call a super expander, uh, one which for every uh, uniformly convex body has some Poincare inequality with an absolute constant. Um, such super expanders when constructed in very different ways uh, one by Laforgue using number theory, um, and uh, one by Mendel and Naor who used the zigzag product construction. Uh, anyway, we have such things and they're important. Uh, they imply low bounds on distortion, not in, uh, you know, not just for embeddings, not just for distortion, but actually for coarse embeddings. So I want to define what coarse embeddings are. There'll be only one slide on this if you are not interested <laughs> in this topic. Uh, let's talk about coarse embeddings into L2. Now metric space has a coarse embedding into L2 into Hilbert space. Uh, now this think of this metric space as infinite, otherwise it makes no sense. If the, you know, the mapping somehow respects the distances, the original distances, and it can be as weak as you want. All you want is that there are, you know, arbitrary, unbounded functions so that the um, distance in this uh, image is bounded above and below by some functions of the original distance. So it's much, much weaker notion than distortion. And you may ask whether uh, you can do this. Uh, I mean, uh, you know, whether they exist or uh, doesn't exist such embeddings, much weaker embeddings. In fact, we want to show that they don't, even though people believe that they are. And uh, Gromov uh, managed to create appropriate expanders. In fact, it's a finally generated, in fact, a finally presented group, infinite group, whose uh, Cayley graph the metric has no course embedding into L2. And it chooses expanders and many more random expanders. There's no complete uh, explicit construction there. Uh, amazing construction, and then other people, uh, you know, sort of 
extend the field de the details and uh, there it is. And this is related or his motivation really for doing that was that uh, it goes in the direction of disproving uh, very strong conjectures in uh, you know, geometry topology of Novikov and of bound cones. I don't know the complete status of this, namely whether it's uh, uh, refuted, any of them refuted the similar conjecture. But anyway, it goes against the uh, intuition in the field. So expanders are, are useful in this mathematical area and uh, um, yeah, actually to fundamental questions. And as I mentioned to other mathematical areas, but I will not talk about it. I want to show you one more application, my favorite, and then uh, talk five minutes about construction. I think, I mean, yes. can I ask a short question? Yeah. Uh, I mean, I remember that is this Mendel Maor and or they said something that it's better than random, that random do not satisfy there. Is there a kind of an intuition why random, which, which are kind of considered always as the best, are not as good as this one, as the one they constructed? What, what, what get wrong with random? Yes. Uh, first of all, you should know that uh, as you provided examples where explicit can do better than random, for example, for the girls problem. Uh, but uh, I cannot tell you uh, why random graphs don't work for this. They are, uh, it's a very good point to raise that uh, often, not often, sorry, rarely, but in really interesting cases, explicit constructions can do better than probabilistic constructions. And uh, when it happens, uh, it's really interesting. Also in error correcting codes, uh, you can do better than uh, Gilbert Varshamov. And, uh, yeah, there are sometimes algebraic constructions or combinatorial constructions are explicit and uh, achieve things you cannot do uh, randomly. Monotone expanders are another example. And anyway, it's a rich question, but I don't know to answer your specific question, Alex. So here's my favorite uh, application, very short one slide. A maze exploration. Uh, here's a story, basically. I mean, maze exploration is really a metaphor. I mean, it's a problem that existed in antiquity when, uh, you know, uh, with the maze and the Minotaur, Greek mythology, and exists when you have a, you know, autonomous vehicle on an unknown terrain, let's say Mars, and lots of other situations. But uh, one particular one that was relevant is a story I told before. They had the cell phone, you know, smartphones and Google Maps and Waze and all these things. Uh, you land in a city you don't know. And, uh, you know, the taxi cab drops you somewhere and you want to get to your hotel. Uh, you'll recognize your hotel, uh, but you don't have a map of the city. And uh, uh, you don't have memory. I mean, you don't have, of course, in principle, you could have just started walking and drawn a map of what you've seen and eventually <laughs> explored everything. But uh, yeah, you don't have so much memory. So without map and memory. And there is a solution, beautiful solution that uh, um, was discovered in the 80s. Uh, it's simple, just walk randomly. If you walk randomly in this city, at every corner you just go randomly in one of the possible directions you have. And uh, it will take you not only to your hotel, but to every hotel and every place in the city. If the city has n intersections, and no, it doesn't have to be a planar thing, it can be any graph of size n. Uh, in about n square steps, you'll get to uh, every vertex with very high probability. So here's the solution for you. You don't have to memorize anything. You just, you can cover the whole graph and just at every point, you know, maybe know where you are and, uh, you know, know the uh, few directions you can go. Then you go, you can forget the path. And the major question in complexity theory was whether this can be de-randomized. It was known as the S equals, uh, uh, SL equals L question whether this can be de-randomized. 
And this was solved amazingly by Ryan Gold in 2005. Uh, basically, so in our language, it's SL equals L. Basically, what he found that you can compute a deterministic walk, right, originally without uh, knowing the city, uh, like a universal walk, computable in log space, and it will visit every vertex of every graph starting anywhere. This construction uses in a beautiful way the zigzag construction of expanders that I told you about that come from this, uh, this paper. So this is uh, yeah, my favorite uh, application of expanders. Okay, that was the end of the uh, applications. Yeah, I have 10 minutes, that's good. So questions? Okay. okay. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, can I ask a question about the sorting network? Maybe yeah. Uh, yeah. one or maybe two questions. One is, uh, is there a general connection? So if you can do the construction with any graph, you can repeat the graph some number of times yes. and get a network uh, and I guess that if you do it, if it's connected, it will be sorting. I point. guess, yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Um, is there a connection between the number of repetitions and the eigenvalue? I wouldn't be surprised, but it's, uh, yeah, yeah, maybe. Possible. Okay. Possible. And uh, maybe a related question is, um, if you, so a general, ex there are uh, permutations that make the symmetric group expanding. Yes. If you use these permutations, uh, which is a stronger property than just being an expander, does it, or is it, can it imply a better, a simpler, it's possible, it's just that the analysis of this type of problem, this is the key issue, it's not the expansion, uh, it's, well, it is the expansion, but I mean, the nature of the problem, sorting, uh, just is, I think, what makes it complicated. The notion of progress, maybe you are right and the stronger expanders will be useful, but I don't know. Yeah, it's a good thing to think about. Okay, so let me uh, spend five minutes on construction because that was not the topic of the talk and then uh, mention a couple of open problems. So I want to talk just about general methods uh, of constructing expanders. Amir just mentioned that for very specific uh, cases there are special tools that Casabo's celebrated result of uh, proving that the symmetric group is expanding with a constant number of permutations is such an example, it's very specific. But I want to talk about general methods. Uh, and by now we have five of them, if uh, may maybe more, but I'll mention five. <clears throat> Just that you get the sense of the scope of the mathematics that goes into, into this. And I'll mention for it just a few essential references. I may be missing a lot. And I have names for them, but uh, you know, they are not official names, they are my names. So uh, <clears throat> more or less historically, the mother group method, really what generated the first explicit constructions by Margulis and then Subotsky, Philip Sarnak used it in a powerful way and many others. <clears throat> in this method, <clears throat> it's general in the following sense. So uh, many methods just construct expanding groups and the groups and uh, generate also that the Cayley graph is an expander. Here, you generate, you, you take some uh, infinite group like SL2Z uh, or SLNZ. Uh, you prove some property about it like property T of Kashdan. I'm not going to go into this. And this implies that all its final quotients or certain final quotients of it uh, result in final graphs, and these graphs are expanded. That's the mother group method, very powerful. Then there's property tau of Lubotsky and many others, or some others. <clears throat> there's a different uh, 
method that sort of spun off uh, from the first when Yudha Shalom uh, <coughs> found a way to ex make explicit bounds on Margulis's construction using what's called bounded generation. And this became very powerful with the uh, various extensions of Kasabov and Nikolov, uh, talking about matrix uh, groups in which the elements are from certain rings and so on. Uh, so it's another way to get infinite groups uh, whose quotients are finite. This was the first method in work of uh, Lubotsky, Kasabov, and Nikolov that uh, resulting, resulted in a proof that all finite simple groups, well, almost all, but let's say all finite simple groups can be expanding with a constant number of generators. Then uh, came the zigzag product method, uh, this work with uh, Rangos and Vadan, in which uh, uh, we just found a combinatorial way of constructing expanders. This is an iterative method. It's a notion of taking products of graphs and using iteration, just build larger and larger graphs, all of whom are uh, expanding. Uh, at the time, uh, we had this, we thought that, uh, you know, it has nothing to do with groups. It, uh, not only the method was combinatorial, but we cannot generate Cayley graphs. But then uh, uh, with Alon and Lubotsky, we actually realized that uh, zigzag product is really a combinatorial generalization of uh, semi-direct products in groups. And using that, some uh, Cayley groups, Cayley graphs were constructed. Um, then came the very powerful uh, result in the 2000s of using arithmetic combinatorics to prove expansion. Uh, it was Helf Helfgott who was the first to realize that the famous sum product theorem uh, over finite fields um, of Bourguin uh, uh, and Tau, uh, which is a major result in arithmetic combinatorics can be used to uh, uh, prove expansion in groups. In fact, I remember that before we did this, Alex Lubotsky asked me once, why can't uh, some product prove arithmetic uh, expansion in groups? After all, uh, you know, you have sum and product and when you multiply matrices, you do sum and product. So, uh, <laughs> help God did it. And this was taken by Bourguin and Gumbold and uh, they managed to prove expansion in a very different way uh, than Selberg of uh, SLTP. And, uh, and this was extended by Bouillard and Tau and many others uh, to again replicate the result that all finite simple groups can be made expanding with a constant number of generators. And in fact, uh, for Bourguin Gambold, in fact, with just random generators would do. And the last one, uh, another big splash, the, the lifting method. Uh, this was another combinatorial iterative construction due to Bilu and Lineal uh, of building larger graphs uh, from smaller ones by taking covers, taking random covers, in fact. And uh, they showed that in principle it could uh, build expanders also. And the big splash came where uh, Marcos Spielman and Srivastava realized using their method of uh, interlacing polynomials that you can analyze the bilinear construction and in fact prove the conjecture, the very bold conjecture they made. And uh, I'm not going to it, but what it implies that you can construct a Manujan graph. Uh, namely tight eigenvalue bound using this combinatorial method, which went against some intuition of some number theory. And this was still a, an existential argument. Cohen made it explicit, so you can actually make it explicit. So this is just a quick summary uh, of showing you the, the broad field of uh, ways of constructing expanders and how rich it is. Uh, okay, let me, questions about this? Okay, 
So I want to end up with uh, uh, just really few. Of course, I have zillions of open problems about expanders. Few of my favorite ones. Uh, the first one I mentioned already is to construct lossless expanders. And here I mean not bipartite expanders where you have lossless expansion from one side to the other, but simply, you know, graphs for which every small linear size set expand by a factor of nearly d, 0.9d. Ramanujan graphs are not enough for that. Eigenvalue bounds even can't help. So it's a really, you know, basically vertex expansion is much more poorly understood than edge, edge expansion. And they're related only if you don't care about constants, but here we care about constants. So you want to have many, many neighbors, as many as possible, you can see. This will be extremely interesting. So I'd say also a simpler method would be nice. I mean, I mentioned that it, we proved it using zigzag, but it's a hell of a zigzag. It's much more complicated than the original zigzag product. And uh, uh, anyway. I won't go into it. A simpler way of constructing lossless expanders, anything above a half D would be really nice. This will beat the, you know, we'll have to bypass the eigenvalue issue. Uh, then there are these uh, very unbalanced bipartite expanders that I really want to construct. So here I don't want a constant factor ratio between the sides, I want polynomial ratio. So here's an example of some parameters. Uh, this may be called rate concentrators. Uh, think that the left hand side is, let's say, n cubed vertices. The right hand side is much smaller, it's just n squared vertices. But all I want is the sets on the left that are of size at most n will, you know, see as many neighbors and the, as their size. They'll be, they have a perfect matching to the right hand side. Of course, I want constant degree on the left. Now, it's very easy to see that random graphs are like that, and nobody has any idea how to do it. If you allow the degree to be polylog, then we know how to do it. These are called extractors, uh, but constant degree D, nobody has any idea, any tool to do this. So I really love this problem. And finally, um, I really find the question of which groups are expanding with a constant number of generators, just characterize them. Uh, really interesting. We understand very little. Uh, well, we understand a lot, but uh, <laughs> um, there's a lot more to understand. As I said, we know that all finite simple groups are expanding. We know very few examples of non-simple ones. And uh, that's about it. So I think it's really interesting and uh, like a lot of past work uh, on expander construction in group theory, which uh, caused the invention of lots of lots more group theory. Uh, I think this will, uh, it's a very basic property. It's a very basic property. And I think it's interesting to understand what it is related other properties of groups it is related to. This is it. <laughs> okay, so uh, yeah, questions, comments. Some uh, tractor or something. Um, we uh, thank you by, by chat, Avi. Just uh, the, in case you know this, uh, uh, for again for this embedding, the random graphs. To uh, what what is the largest p for which you can prove that you cannot embed it? Is it true for every? No, no, for LP, no, no. For LP, it's not. Matoshek's result says that any expander is an LP expander. So, so, but LP for what? For P less than infinity, I guess not for L infinity. No, not for, yeah. Between one and, and yeah, any finite number. But like including one. one and not including infinity. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Exactly. It's a beautiful paper.
have what might be a, a more basic question, but if you have one of these these bipartite graphs where you only care about sort of expansion going in one direction, yeah. um, is there a way to relate that to the um, to some spectral property of like? The no, 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 because uh, no, no, it, uh, there isn't. Yeah, you can take this the uh, Ramanujan graphs in the counter example I mentioned and make them bipartite, or they may be bipartite already and uh, you wouldn't get it no now basically you know you'll find uh sets of size two that see only three neighbors in a maybe in a cubic graph so anyway you can yeah so kahale has its uh, counter examples that are very powerful it's it's really uh it's not a spectral property vertex expansion uh, goes beyond spectral expansion if you are interested in this regime above G over two. So we really need uh, some other tools for that. Like I mentioned, you know, if you knew all the eigenvalues and all the eigenvalues, <laughs> yeah. Uh, Avi, when you say, when you know all the eigenvectors, wh what, what kind of properties of eigenvectors can I give you so that you can get the losses expand? I mean, obviously, I can if I if I really know everything, then I can I can do everything with the graph. But is there like a criterion and saying that all the all the non-trivial eigenvectors have a certain support or something like yeah, that? I, I I never tried. It it will be complicated. All I all I say is that uh, a property like this, you know, this set of vertices is connected to that set of vertices can be expressed algebraically, right? And uh, um, then you can express it, you know, just expand it according to the eigenvalues of the eigenvector, then you get something. Uh, but I don't know, uh, you know, anything clean that will capture this. And it may, may be worthwhile doing, but uh, yeah, I, I expect it will be something complex, not clean. But maybe not. <laughs> No question. Is there any reason to believe that the loss like ex expanders even exist? We proved that, oh, they exist, yeah, random ones are. Random ones easily are. In, in a ra random deregular graph, uh, small sets, even in our site, let's say n over 100 d, or n over a million d, will C uh, D times the size minus something that's, you know, we'll see D minus little old D times the size, not just 0.6 or 0 0.99. It's, yeah. You can look at the calculation in the book. Uh, you have it. It's, yeah, they, they exist abundantly. <laughs> Okay, <laughs> last chance. Okay, thank you guys. Thank you. Bye. I'll cut it. I will go back to bed. <laughs> yeah, I will. <laughs> thank you. Yeah. <laughs>